In labs nine and 10, we're going to be looking at the fungi. In lab nine, we'll be looking at yeasts, and in lab 10, we'll look at the molds. So let's start with an introduction to fungi. Uh, as we've learned, fungi are eukaryotic organisms. They include yeasts, molds, and fleshy fungi. Now, yeasts are microscopic single-celled fungi. Molds are multinucleated filamentous fungi. And the fleshy fungi include things like mushrooms and puffballs. All fungi are chemoheterotrophs, and that means that they require organic compounds for both energy and carbon, and they obtain nutrients by absorbing them from their environment. The majority of fungi live off of decaying organic material, and organisms that live off of decaying organic material are called saprophytes. But some of the fungi are parasitic, getting their nutrients from living plants or animals. The study of fungi is called mycology, and diseases caused by fungi are referred to as mycoses. Keep in mind though that fungi are generally beneficial to humans like most many bacteria. They're involved in the decay of dead plants and animals, in other words, recycling nutrients in nature. They're used to manufacture a variety of industrial and food products. Uh, they are involved in the production of many antibiotics like the penicillins and cephalosporins. And of course, they can be eaten themselves for food. But fungi cause a lot of damage too. They damage wood fabrics, they spoil foods, and they cause a variety of plant and animal diseases, including, of course, some human infections. So in this lab, we'll be looking at the yeasts. Now, as mentioned, yeast are unicellular oval to spherical fungi, and they increase numbers asexually by a process called budding. Uh, bud forms around a nucleus following mitosis, and that bud then becomes a new yeast cell, as we see in figure one, a photomicrograph of Baker's yeast or Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Now, uh, yeast can also form fragile uh, branching filaments called hyphae. Many yeast can anyway. In figure 10, we see the yeast Canada albicans that we'll mention shortly, instead of budding, starts producing a filamentous structure called a hypha. And we'll see some examples of that coming up. Now, because yeast are single-celled and microscopic like bacteria, yeast colonies look similar to bacterial colonies when we grow them on a solid medium. Whereas molds, because they're produced of filaments called hyphae, tend to look more thread-like or fuzzy when they grow, as we'll see in lab 10. So here's a scanning electron micrograph of Baker's E. Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is the one we looked at in figure one, where we see it under conventional microscope with the buds. And in this electron micrograph, we can see very nicely uh, the buds forming on some of the yeast cells. And once the bud breaks off, that leaves behind little scars called bud scars. And a single yeast can bud several times, as we'll see. Here's an electron micrograph of Canada albicans, which reminds you that these are eukaryotic. So it has a cytoplasmic membrane, it has a cell wall, as all fungi do, but it has all the internal membrane-bound organelles of eukaryotic cell, including many mitochondria, a nucleus with a nuclear membrane, a nucleolus, endoplasmic reticulum, vacuoles and such. And here's a nice little movie of yeast reproducing by budding over time lapse. We'll let that load in. And let me skip ahead a little bit here, past all the introduction so we can see the budding. So again, here we see the yeast producing buds. And that's their means of asexual reproduction. So there's a nice photomicrograph there of yeast budding. Uh, yeast can also reproduce sexually, but we're not gonna really get into their sexual reproduction very much. Now yeasts are facultative anaerobes. They grow with or without oxygen. So they obtain energy by both aerobic respiration and anaerobic fermentation. 
keeping in mind the vast majority of yeasts are non-pathogenic and of great value in the industry, like, uh, for example, with the yeast Saccharomyces, the ones used in baking and in brewing. But we're going to zero in on here are several pathogenic or opportunistic yeasts, the most common ones that cause human infections. And by far the most common yeast to infect humans is the yeast Canada. And this is common because Canada is normal flora of our gastrointestinal tract. Now it's also found on the skin, the mucous membranes in the mouth and vagina in small amounts, probably getting there as a result of the GI tract. But the thing that keeps Canada in check in the body so it doesn't normally cause infections are two things. First of all, the body's normal immune defenses keep it under control. And then secondly, the body's normal bacterial microbiota. The yeast have to compete with all the bacterial microbiota for the same nutrients, so that holds them in check. But Canada is more of an opportunistic pathogen. Uh, it can overgrow the host if the host becomes immunosuppressed, where the first factor, the normal immune defenses, are no longer keeping it under control, or the person can be given broad-spectrum antibacterial antibiotics that destroy the normal bacterial microbiota that keep the yeast in check. And keep in mind, since Canada is eukaryotic, the antibiotics we used against prokaryotic bacteria will have no effect on the yeast. Now, any infection caused by Canada is called a candidiasis. And some of the most common forms, it often infects the mouth, which we call oral mucocutaneous candidi candidiasis, or more commonly, thrush. So when it grows in the mouth, we often see uh, these whitish inflamed patches that can appear on the tongue, on the roof of the mouth, on the sides of the mouth and such. And that can become quite painful. If we take do a mouth smear of a person with thrush, we see the things we would expect to see in the mouth, epithelial cells and normal microbiota. But we know this person has thrush because of all the budding yeast that we see there, which should not be found in the mouth normally in large amounts. It's also the most common cause of vaginitis. And here we see the base of the cervix. And again, you see the white inflamed patches where the yeast is growing. If we do a smear from that, we can see the epithelial cells in the vagina, lots of normal microbiota, but then we see the yeast here. Now in this case, when it gets into the body like this, we often see it switching from its oval budding form to its hyphal form, where it produces hyphae, and the yeast then bud off of the hyphae. Uh, it can infect the penis, that's called balantitis. And uh, women with vaginitis can give that to males. Males, if not treated, can give it back to females, so it can go back and forth that way. But it infects the nails. It's called oncomycosis. It's actually infecting the nail beds, and the nails usually be, or the uh, nail beds become red and inflamed. And when it infects skin, often moist skin, it's called dermatitis. Diaper rash, for example, is, an exa uh, is a dermatitis of moist skin. Since a candida is in the GI tract of the baby and it sits on moist skin under a diaper, that gives prime conditions for it to grow and cause inflammation. Candida can also sometimes cause urinary tract infections. Uh, but when people are given broad spectrum antibiotics or cytotoxic drugs like used for cancer chemotherapy or immunosuppressive drugs to accept transplants, or if a person has immunosuppressive diseases, things like diabetes, leukemias, and AIDS, this can cause uh, candida because cause severe infections that can involve the skin, the lungs, the heart, and other organs. And in fact, candida now accounts for 10% of the cases of septicemia or infections of the blood in a hospital. And of course, it can infect many parts of the body, the esophagus, trachea, bronchi, lungs, etc. Now again, the most common species of Canada that infects humans is Canada albicans. That causes 50 to 60% of all Canada infections, with a couple of other species accounting for the remaining parts. It also should be mentioned that recently a new yeast uh, in terms of human infections, Canada aureus has become quite significant. Uh, it was once a not thought to be a non-pathogenic yeast, but this is now causing 
still relatively rare, but severe infections in patients have been hospitalized for long periods of time where it can enter the bloodstream causing invasive infections throughout the body. And Canada auris is often resistant to all of our common antifungal antibiotics and may kill as many as one out of three people when it causes invasive infections. So this is kind of a growing concern in the hospital environment, Canada auris. Now we say Canada is a dimorphic fungi. Dimorphic literally means it has two different growth forms. It can grow as an oval budding yeast, which it often does when we grow it in the lab on a Petri plate, but the budding yeast may elongate and start producing filament structures called pseudohyphae, which eventually can develop into true hyphae. So here's a picture of Canada starting to produce hyphae, where instead of budding, uh, it produces these elongated filaments called hyphae. And a hypha is what we call a single uh, filament of a mold. So this is growing, it's starting to grow in its mold-like form where it produces hyphae rather than reproducing strictly by budding. And when Canada is in its hypha form under the right conditions, it can uh, reproduce by budding, producing what are called blastoconidia. And these are clusters of uh, budding yeast that often appear along the hypha, often where the hyphae are branching. And then under certain conditions, Canada albicans can produce some thick walled survival spores called chlamydoconidia. And in, uh, in this figure, we see Canada in its dimorphic form producing hyphae, the filaments that we see here clusters of budding yeast off of the hyphae called blastoconidia, and then often single thick-walled survival spores called chlamydospores or chlamydoconidia now. So the presence of hyphae, blastoconidia, and chlamydoconidia can often be used to identify yeast as Canada albicans. And we're seeing this when we grow the fungi on rice extract agar in today's lab. So the production of hyphae probably helps the yeast to invade deeper tissues after it colonizes the skin and often inside the body or when it gets under the skin, it does produce its hyphal form. Uh, another fairly common opportunistic yeast is Cryptococcus neoformans. And uh, this appears as typical uh, yeast cells, around five to six micrometers in diameter but they're surrounded by a thick capsule. And the capsule like bacterial capsules can help the yeast to resist phagocytic engulfment. And Cryptococcus neoformans is also a dimorphic yeast in that it can grow as a budding yeast form or can produce hyphae. Now the majority of Cryptococcus infections are mild or subclinical. Uh, when it is, does become symptomatic, it usually begins in the lungs after you inhale large quantities of yeast typically from dried bird feces or soil contaminated with dried bird feces, often pigeon and chicken droppings. Now, Cryptococcus actually lives in the soil, but the presence of the bird guano provides the right nutrients for the yeast to grow like crazy in the bird feces and the contaminated soil. And again, as that dries and becomes airborne, it can be inhaled and if large enough quantities of that are inhaled, it can overwhelm body defenses, causing first a pulmonary infection. But if a person is immunocompromised, it may from the lungs get into the blood and spread to the meninges and other body areas. And when it does get from the lungs into the meninges, it's called cryptococcal meningoencephalitis. It can also cause some cutaneous infections and infections of body organs. Now, one quick way to identify cryptococcal meningoencephalitis is to do a spinal tap, remove spinal fluid, and mix it with either India ink or nigrosin. And in this way, you get to see the encapsulated budding oval yeast cells in the spinal fluid as we see in figure 4A. Uh, so here we see the yeast, we see the buds forming, but again, you notice the thick, clear capsule surrounding the yeast in this uh, smear 
the, uh, the spinal fluid that was mixed with India ink. So this person would have cryptococcal meningoencephalitis as shown by the encapsulated yeast cells in the spinal fluid. A third opportunistic yeast is pneumocystis yervecci, and this causes a disease called pneumocystis pneumonia, or PCP. Now, this is seen almost exclusively only in highly immunosuppressed individuals, uh, those with late-stage AIDS, late-stage malignancies, or leukemias. And pneumocystis yervecci is kind of a unique yeast. In the early days of the AIDS epidemic, this was one of the more common uh, infections in AIDS patients and one of the more common causes of death in AIDS patients. And at the time, it was thought that this organism, Pneumocystis yervici, uh, which was called Pneumocystis carinii back then, um, was thought to be a protozoan. So most of the terms we see here that describe the life cycle of this yeast are terms we actually use to describe protozoa. Uh, you don't have to know the different forms, but let me just mention that to you. So the trophozoite is actually a haploid form, about one to four micrometers in diameter that replicates by mitosis and binary fissions in the lungs of someone who's immunosuppressed. If we look at the life cycle here, on the left we see the asexual reproduction in the lungs where the uh, yeast undergoes mitosis and divides by binary fission, reproducing asexually. But then a pre-cystic form can form where haploid trophozoic forms that we just talked about conjugate or fuse together, producing a diploid pre-cyst, and that eventually evolves into a mature cyst forms. Now, uh, during this process, the yeast undergoes meiosis for, and goes back from its diploid form to produce several intracystic bodies, or spores called ascospores. And then that eventually ruptures, releasing the haploid ascospores, which become the trophozoite form of the yeast that can reproduce asexually by mitosis and binary fission again. Here's a figure nine shows you a cyst form with the eight little haploid uh, ascospores inside. And those can be seen in the lungs also in a person with pneumocystis pneumonia. And so in its cyst form, as we see in figure five, uh, once the ascospores are released from the cyst, these being the cysts here, uh, what's left behind is the empty shell of the cyst. And when people were initially looking at the lungs of people infected with pneumocystis yervecci that had pneumocystis pneumonia, they would see these empty cyst bodies uh, in the lung aspirates from the lung and they remarked that it often looked like crushed ping pong balls in the lungs. So this is one of the diagnostic features we can look for to diagnose the person as having pneumocystis pneumonia. And we see that in figure five. So if we go back to our life cycle, on the right hand side we see the sexual cycle of the yeast where two of the haploid trophozoites that we saw on the left uh, fuse together or conjugate, producing a diploid precyst that undergoes meiosis, producing eight uh, spore like bodies or intracystic bodies called ascospores. And when those are released, that re they, those become the haploid yeast form that reproduces asexually again, leaving behind the empty cyst bodies. And finally, we'll look at Malassezia globosa. Uh, this is the frequent cause of a superficial skin infection called tinea versicolor. Now, Malassezia globosa, here we see it in its budding yeast form, but it also can uh, produce a hyphal form. So it too is dimorphic. And here we see the hyphal form of the Malassezia. So tinea versicolor is a fairly common superficial skin infection, and it usually causes hypopigmentation of the skin, although it can also cause hyperpigmentation. Hypopigmentation is where the skin uh, becomes lighter, or the uh, 
the area where the uh, yeast is growing becomes lighter than the rest of the skin, hyperpigmentation where it becomes darker. So if we take a look at some of these pictures, these are all examples of hypopigmentation of the skin. So it often appears as little white patches along the skin where the yeast is growing, but sometimes it can appear darker and that's called hyperpigmentation when that happens. In addition to causing tinea versicolor, this is the most common cause of dandruff. So those are the yeasts we're going to be looking at today, the opportunistic or pathogenic yeast. And we're going to use three different augers today to grow the yeasts. Uh, the first one, sabrodextrose auger or SDA. Uh, this is an auger that has a higher sugar concentration and a lower pH than typical auger, and both a high sugar concentration and a low pH inhibit bacterial growth, but promote fungal growth. So because this medium promotes the growth of fungi, we say it's selective for fungi. Fungi will grow, but bacteria are inhibited. Now remember, if the colonies look smooth or pasty like bacterial colonies, then it's probably a yeast. If it looks uh, composed of filaments or little thread-like structures or looks fuzzy, then it would be a mold. Another medium we're going to use today is called mycocell auger. This has the antibiotic chloramphenicol, which inhibits bacteria, but it also contains a drug called cyclohexamide, and this inhibits most saprophytic or non-pathogenic fungi. So we say that mycocell auger is selective for pathogenic fungi. And again, if the colonies looked uh, smooth and pasty like bacterial colonies, it's probably a pathogenic yeast. If it looks more fuzzy or thread-like like a mold, then it would be a pathogenic mold. And the final medium we're going to use, rice extract auger with polysorbate 80, uh, stimulates candidus to switch from its budding form to its hyphal form or dimorphic form where it produces blastoconidia and chlamydoconidia. So as we showed you previously, uh, when candida switched to its hyphal form, we see these filament structures called hyphae. We see clusters of yeast budding off the hyphae called blastoconidia. And in Canada, albicans, we see these thick-walled survival forms called chlamydoconidia. So we're going to use that today, seeing the presence of hyphae, chlamydoconidia, and blastoconidia to specifically identify the yeast as Canada albicans. Now we can also identify Canada biochemically using sugar fermentations and such, but we're going to identify it using morphology by looking for the production of hyphae, blastoconidia, and chlamydoconidia. So we're using three augers today, the sabrodextrose auger, the mycocell auger, and the rice extract auger. And we're going to be using two different yeasts, Canada albicans, an opportunistic yeast that causes thrush and vaginitis, and then common baker's yeast, a non-pathogenic fungus, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So for your sabrodextrose auger plate or SDA plate and your mycocell auger plate, uh, you're going to divide the plate in half like we see in figure nine. And then you're going to use a sterile swab to streak a single line of Canada albicans on one half of the plate and a single line of Saccharomyces cerevisiae on the other side of the plate. There's two swabs in a packet, so you can use one swab to do your Canada inoculations and the other swab to do your Saccharomyces cerevisiae inoculations. And remember, of course, the used swabs will go into, directly into the container designed for disposing of used swabs and used pipettes. Once you've inoculated the mycocell auger plate and the SDA plate with Canada and Saccharomyces, then incubate them upside down, stacked in your Petri plate holder at 37 degrees Celsius on the shelf corresponding to your lab section. So again, the sabrodextrose auger and the mycocell auger plates are going to go at 37 degrees Celsius. Now the third auger we're going to use is the rice extract auger. And the best way to do this inoculation is look at figure 10. So what you're going to do uh, to prepare for your rice extract auger plate inoculation 
is to take a uh, clean cover slip and turn your plate upside down, lay the uh, cover slip on the bottom of the plate and outline it with your wax marker because that's where the cover slip's going to go and you want to keep your inoculation lines within that range so that it's covered by the cover slip. This Petri plate is going to go directly under a microscope to observe the results. So the cover slip is there, first of all, to help Canada switch to its dimorphic form, but also to protect the lens from coming in contact with the yeast when we use our focusing. So once you've drawn an outline of the cover slip on the bottom of the plate, then you're going to uh, use your inoculating loop to streak two parallel lines on the uh, surface of the rice tract agar like we see here. So you can just accept after you stir up the yeast, dip in your inoculating loop and make two single streaks. You only have to dip it in once and then make an S mark that goes through the two lines like we see here. And then of course, sterilize your inoculating loop. Once you've inoculated the plate, and remember we're only putting Canada albicans on the rice extract agar plate because we're using this agar to identify Canada albicans. So once you've done that, pick up a glass cover slip with four sips, dip the cover slip in alcohol, shake it a couple of times to remove the excess alcohol, and then using your butane lighter, catch the alcohol on fire and let it burn out. And that will sterilize the cover slip without heating the glass. Let the cover slip cool for a few seconds and put it over where you put the streak lines where you've outlined where the cover slip goes. Now this plate's gonna be incubated upside down at room temperature, not 37 degrees. So again, double check to make sure your rice extract agar plate goes at room temperature. And then finally, there's a number of demonstrations we're gonna show you under the microscope. We have a direct stain of baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And if you see this under the microscope, you recognize that it's simply some yeast. We can't tell which yeast it is because one yeast pretty much looks like another yeast under a microscope. But because of the size, the oval shape, and the budding, we can recognize that as a yeast. We also have a direct stain of the yeast Canada albicans that causes thrush and vaginitis. But again, we can only tell that it's a yeast uh, when we look at it under the microscope, again, by the size, the budding. So on either of those, simply recognize that it is a yeast of some kind. Then we have a stained mouth smear from a person with thrush, a Canada albicans infection of the mouth. And as we see in figure 7a, we should recognize that this person has thrush. We can tell they have thrush because there's budding yeast cells that should not be there in large quantity, along with the normal microbiota, the epithelial cells and such. But it's the budding yeast that tells us this person has thrush. One of the dangers of thrush, especially in people that are immunocompromised, is from the mouth it can spread down into the bronchi and the lungs. And this is a stain of some lung tissue uh, from a mouse that's infected with Canada. The clear areas here are the alveoli or air sacs, but we see all the yeast that are scattered and growing in the lungs there. So uh, that's one of the dangers of thrush is it can go lower in the respiratory tract. Uh, we also have a picture of the Indy ink preparation of spinal fluid from a person that has cryptococcal meningoencephalitis. As we see in figure 4b again, uh, this is a yeast Often, although it is, can be oval, it looks kind of round. It has nice little buds on a short stalk. But the main key here is that it is surrounded by a capsule. So again, when the spinal fluid is mixed with India ink, we can see the yeast inside and the clear capsule surrounding it. So this person most likely would have cryptococcal meningoencephalitis. And finally, we have the cyst form of pneumocystis yerevechi from uh, aspirates from lung tissue. And this is the way to look on the slide we have. Uh, the slides kind of fade, but these are the cyst bodies. When they look round, those are the cysts. And the ones that kind of look like someone took a mallet and smashed a ping pong ball, all of these shapes here, those are the empty cyst bodies. So if we see those, uh, we know the person has pneumocystis pneumonia.
So today you'll do the inoculations. Next time you can record your results in the results section here. And of course, don't forget we have your performance objectives at the end that tell you what you have to know on the quiz that covers yeast along with the potential practical questions under results. And as always, we have our self quiz with answers at the end.